live from Barcelona, Spain, it's theCUBE, covering Cisco Live Europe. Brought to you by Cisco and its ecosystem partners. Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage here in Barcelona, Spain for Cisco Live Europe 2019. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE, with Dave Vellante as well as Stu Miniman, who's been doing interviews with us all week. Our next guest is Roland Akra, Akra Senior Vice President, General Manager of the Data Center Group. He's in charge of that core business, the data center now at the center of cloud and the edge. Roland, great to see you, thanks for coming on. Thank you, thank you for having me. So, a lot of announcements, all the big guns are out there for Cisco. You got the data center, you got the networking group, and you got IoT, and then cloud center suite was part of the big announcement. Your team had a big piece of the keynote yesterday and continues to make waves. Give us a quick update on the news, the key points, what was the announcements? Yeah, the two big announcements from my group were ACI Anywhere and Hyperflex Anywhere, and we captured them under a common moniker of there's nothing centered about the data center anymore, because both of these speak to things going outside the data center. ACI Anywhere is the integration of ACI, our software-defined networking solution, into the two of the most prominent public cloud providers out there, Amazon and Azure, and for Hyperflex Anywhere, the exciting news is the expansion of Hyperflex, which is our hyper-converged solution, also outside the data center to the edge of the enterprise, specifically branch offices and remote locations. Uh, and the other thing that came out of the, our conversation here in the queue and also in the keynote is that the center of the value is the data center, as you guys pointed out with the slides, big circle in the middle, ACI Anywhere, Hyperflex Anywhere, but the network and the data and the security foundation has been a critical part of this new growth. Yes. Take a minute to explain the journey of ACI, how it started, where are we? It's, it's been a progression for you guys, certainly inside the enterprise. Yes. But now it's extended. What's the journey? Take us through that. Yeah. When ACI came into the market five years ago now, we have a five year anniversary, ACI brought a software defined networking solution into the market. It brought an automated network fabric capability which said you can, you can no longer screw yourself up by having uh, incoherence between one part of the network or another, it's all managed coherently as one thing. And it brought, to your point about security, what's called segmentation of applications. Today, applications have data, they have databases, they have different sensitive pieces, and it's important to be able to tell the network not only get the traffic from one place to the other, but also selectively get the traffic that I tell you to get there and not the one, and don't get there the traffic that has no business getting there. And that's known as segmentation which is a security concern, particularly when you have sensitive data like consumer data or things that have uh, regulatory things around them. ACI has brought that to the market. That was the value proposition of ACI. We worked on then expanding ACI in the direction of scale. Customers have two or more data centers for disaster recovery, for resiliency. We made that possible. We got to bigger and bigger footprints. Then we took ACI to the edge of the enterprise. What if somebody wanted to put some computing capability you know, in a store or in a uh, logistics center. ACI then was expanded with that. Step N minus one was we took ACI to bare metal clouds. Customers now want to deploy also things in co-locations or bare metal clouds. We decoupled ACI software from the Cisco switches, which is the ACI hardware, and ACI became completely virtualized and still able to be doing everything it does in hardware on premise in software instead in somebody else's capability. And yesterday we announced the full culmination of this, which is what if there is, you don't want the ACI um, uh, soft switching or hard switching, can you use the native switching of a public cloud, like Azure or AWS, and you tell them via their APIs, please let those packets go from A to B because they're part of the whitelisted uh, uh, paths, and don't let packets from C to D go because they're part of the blacklisted paths. And that was the full integration with these clouds. And, and you abstract that complexity. Completely, customers. completely. So one one orchestrator, which is uh, you know the, the multi-site orchestrator, the same one people have used on-premise that they've developed their policies around, so they really have invested a lot of sweat equity in that uh, controller. It's where also they put their compliance, uh, verification and audit and assurance, and they use that thing even when something goes to Azure or it goes to AWS. So you mentioned the progression, so this is now your full progression, you know, from core to the cloud, including edge. Going through edge. What has been some of the results? You mentioned that segmentation is one of them, I get that. How has ACI been used? What are some highlights? 
that show the value because people start looking at ACI saying, hmm, I like this, I like scale. I have a scale challenge with the new cloud world and edge and complexity is abstracted away with software. Okay, check, so far so good. Where has been the success of ACI and how do you see that yeah. unfolding specifically in the cloud? Yeah, the biggest value our customers have gotten, cloud or no cloud, has been with ACI, they've been able to shorten the speed of change, shorten the, the time for change, therefore increase the speed of change of their network. Because now the network needs to operate at the speed of the applications. Applications reconfigure themselves sometimes on hourly or daily basis. And it used to be that changing something in the network, you know, you sent a ticket to somebody who took weeks to reconfigure things. Now, that software-defined capability means the network reconfigures and people can change generations of compute on the fly and the network is in lockstep with them. The agility and speed has been great. The other value has been the value of automation, which is people can run a bigger and bigger and bigger network with a small number of people. You don't have to scale your people the more switches you have. Again, because programming and, and, and automation comes to the rescue with well, that. Well, I'll tell you, people who are watching them right now can look behind Roland and see that it's a packed house. We're in the DevNet zone, which has been the massively growing organization within Cisco. Community's <laughs> been growing very fast. People are developing on top of the networks, and these are network, network folks, and as well as new talent coming in. So skill gap is shortening, so he's getting a different makeup for yes. a Cisco user. Your customers are changing, and changing, growing, existing base, plus new people. Correct. Talk about that dynamic and how that impacts this intent-based networking, this notion of policy yes, and software yes. it, it's, defined. It's you know, what, what many people have been calling infrastructure as code, which is you go from scripting to actually coding and composing very sophisticated automation capabilities and change management capabilities for um, an automatable system, which is what AP, uh, ACI is. Um, it's made for people um, drawing on the strengths that they were doing in the application domain or in the server domain and bringing that into the network. And that's a new and exciting thing. It, it brought the network within the purview of coders, of people who know how to do Python, who know how to do Go language and you know, things which are modern and, and exciting for the younger generation. It's made also for bringing the um, uh, analytical capabilities. You know, a lot of what those young coders are used to is a lot of logs, a lot of visibility, a lot of analytics running on, because they've done that on web servers, they've done that on you know, applications that run in, in the cloud. And we now offer the network, which is very rich in data. If you think about, we see every packet, we see every flow, we see every pattern of how the traffic is changing, and that becomes a data set that is subject to programming, because then from there you can extract anomaly detection, you can extract security uh, signatures of, of, uh, of uh, malware, you could extract a prediction of where the traffic is going to be going in six months. There's a lot of exciting potential from the telemetry and the visibility that uh, we bring into that uh, and, framework. And as you point out, devs love that. I mean, Cisco, we've talked about this, is one of the few large established companies that has, in our view, figured out developers. Right? There's a lot of examples of those <laughs> uh, companies that have it uh, and, and continue to struggle, but just witnessed here, uh, the dev crowd. I want to ask you about uh, ACI and how it's different from, for example, VMware NSX. What's the differentiation there? Yeah, um, the biggest differentiation is ACI is one system through which you manage the entire network. The overlay, which is the virtual view of the network that the applications care about, as well as the underlay, which is the actual real delivery system that, that makes the packets get from A to B with quality of service and so forth. So that's the first thing. It actually does a lot more. It has much more scope mm. than NSX does. The other thing that's uh, very unique about ACI is we have integrated it with every hypervisor on the planet and every container management framework on the planet and every bare metal uh, system on the planet, which means that any workload, something sitting on a mainframe, something sitting on a Sun Oracle server, something on OpenStack, on OpenShift, on VMware, on Hyper-V, and now on the EC2, um, uh, uh, APIs of AWS or on Azure, all of those are integrated with ACI. We're not wedded to one hypervisor, and our cloud implementation that we announced yesterday is a true integrated cloud capability. It's not a bring your own license and go put it on bare metal at AWS, which has been VMware's cloud strategy, is to team up with AWS and let customers bring their software licenses into AWS bare metal. Mm -hmm. That's not EC2. And of course that's not Azure and that's not the other clouds we're going to be doing. So the openness 
to being multi-cloud on-premise, which means every hypervisor and every container framework yeah. and bare metal with one system. We're extending that into the cloud to give customers choice and openness. Yes. That's really a very fundamental so, philosophy. So much approach. wider scope. And that's kind of always been Cisco's philosophy of partnership. When you think about Hyperflex, go back 10 years when you guys sort of created that with partners and then multiple partners now. Maybe talk about that journey a little bit. Um, Hyperflex? Yes. Yeah, because hyperconvergence is another very exciting and fast growing trend in our industry. And really, Hyperflex started off, uh, and with the hyperconverged infrastructure started off being the notion of putting a mini cloud in a box on premise for c application developers to rapidly deploy their applications as if it was in the cloud. So speed and simplicity were really at a premium and that's really what defines hyperconvergence. And we've done a, a tremendous amount of work at Cisco to make speed and simplicity there because we've integrated network compute storage and a cloud management system mm -hmm. in, called Intersight to give that whole capability to customers. We then hardened it. We took it from being able to do uh, VDI kind of workloads and, and rather benign workloads to mission critical workloads. So databases are now running on Hyperflex. ERP systems are running on Hyperflex. The real crown jewels of the enterprise are now running on Hyperflex. Then we made it multi-cloud. We opened it to all hypervisors and to all uh, container frameworks. We announced OpenShift yesterday. We had already done Hyper-V, we had done um, uh, OpenStack and ESX. So again, same spirit of openness. And yesterday's announcement was, what if I want to take hyperconvergence outside of the data center in hundreds or thousands of remote locations? Think a retailer, okay? In a retail environment, some of the most interesting data is born outside the data center. It's born in a store. It, the data is the sensor that follows the customer who's interested in a plasma TV. And that data has a perishable lifetime. You act on it on location and on time, or you lose the value, yeah. right? So sending it over, taking two hours to do a machine learning job on it and come back, the customer is already back home watching a movie. And so the window of opportunity for the data is often right there and then. And that's why our customers are taking their computing environment often to yeah. where the data is to act on it fast and, and in the own location. It sounds easy, but I want to just get your thoughts on this because this is a critical data challenge. If data is stored in classic old ways, data warehouses and you know, fenced off areas, kind of in the internet, you're not going to have the latency to get that data in real time. Talk about real time data that's addressable. Yes. For part of the application value. Yeah. So this is a, a new notion that's emerged with DevOps and infrastructure as code. That's right. That's hard. How do you guys see that progressing? How do, should customers prepare to have that data centered properly for app addressability, yeah. uh, discovery, whatever the usage of the data contextually is, time series data or whatever data it is. Yes. This is a critical thing. It's a critical thing and, and there's no one answer because depending on what the data is, sometimes you only see the value when you concentrate it and consolidate it because the patterns emerge from rolling up a thousand stores worth of data and seeing that people who buy you know, this toothbrush tend to buy that yeah. toothpaste. There may be that value which is where you want to concentrate the data. But there are also many things where acting on the data in the moment and on location quickly without referring to the other thousand stores ex extracts 90% of the value of that data. So that's why you want to do forward deployed computing on that data. So it, this highlights network programmability. Highlights. This means the applications driving the queries or the the network for that data if it's available. So there's two things, network programmability from the app and availability of the data. Yeah, and, and the, the ability for the entire infrastructure, network compute and storage, and hyperconvergence is the uh, automation of all three, to be able to deliver its value equally in remote locations or in a cloud as it would have in, the, in a data center because that's where the application is going to want to go where the value is and if the infrastructure can't follow it there, then you get a degraded uh, ability to uh, take advantage of the opportunity. Right, real time decisions happen at the edge, but then as you described, you got to bring data back, certain data, Some, back to the, to the cloud, do the modeling there, and then push the models back down. And so you got to have decision making distributed. And you got to have low latency to be able to yeah, enable that. Yeah. And, and the know. same goes for other considerations. For example, why is it important to do, um, allow people to put data both on their premises and in the cloud? for disaster recovery, for data replication, mm -hmm. for yeah. resiliency, sometimes for governance reasons. Mm -hmm. GDPR in Europe says the data of European citizens 
that's you know, personally identifying has to stay in Europe. Somebody may not have a data center in Europe. Could they take advantage of a co-location uh, ability or somebody else's this cloud? Is the, this is the theme we're seeing at this show this year and certainly at the center of the, of the news is complexity is increasing because there's just evolution. More devices are connected, diverse <coughs> environments, scale for cloud and connectivity, but software driving that. So I got to ask you the question. Go back to the old days, you know, in the <coughs> 1990s, multi-vendor was a big word. Now multi-cloud feels the same way. Yes. This is the openness thing. How would you describe multi-cloud strategy for Cisco in context of this notion of being open? It is really the, the new um, dimension of, of, of openness, right? We've been open um, in the past to multiple forms of physical networks. Customer wants to use wireless or fiber or copper or what have you. We needed to give them an IP network that operated equally well over all media. That was one dimension of openness. Another dimension of openness was, does a product from vendor A work with a product from vendor B? Right? Uh, my router, your router, my switch, your firewall, yeah. those are other dimensions. Hardware and software coupling. Can I buy the hardware from Peter and the software from Mary? Will it work well? The new dimension of openness is, can a customer avail themselves of any form of cloud, either because they like the tooling and how well their developers yeah. are more efficient on a given cloud, or because the pricing of the other guy, or the third guy has a point of presence in Tokyo, which <laughs> this one doesn't. <laughs> All of those are business choices that if we make our technology, let them take advantage of them with no technical restriction, they win, because now they can shop on the merits of what they want to do, mm -hmm. and not on, oh, well, sorry, if you want to go to Azure, I can't help you, but if you're willing to settle for you know, your own premise or for Amazon, then I have a story for you. Great. So that's Roland, you're leading the team, one of the core crown jewels for Cisco, as you guys, the rising tide is floating all boats here within the company. What's your plan for the year? What's your goals? You'll be out there pounding the pavement with customers. What's your objective? What do you hope to accomplish this year in 2019? Well, 2019 is the year of many things for us. It's a very exciting year. It's the year of, on the, on the physical infrastructure side, we're taking our switches to 400 gigabit per second. We have our new silicon capability, our new optics, so we're going to be able to scale for the cloud providers who are hitting the next frontier of speed and density and scale. So performance will always, always be there. And when we're done with 400, we're already going to be you know, asked about 800. So that's an exciting uh, new generation of switches. Uh, ACI Anywhere getting deployed now and adopted across multiple clouds is another exciting thing. Hyperflex Anywhere, we're really looking forward to the potential in financial services, in logistics, in retail, where there's a lot of deployed uh, data at the edge. Um, and then security is a never finished journey, right? Uh, everything we give our customers in the way of security, because there there's an active actor who's trying to make you fail, right? It's <laughs> not that you, yeah. uh, you're only fighting uh, physics to get to 400 gigabit, then you win. There you have a guy who's trying to foil your, your schemes and trying to foil their yeah. schemes. Constant so attacks are, are on the network. On, you guys have seen this movie before, so you know how critical. Roland, thanks so much for spending the time. Congratulations on uh, ACI Anywhere, Hyperflex Anywhere, intent-based networking at the core. It's the Cube bringing you all the data. We have an intent here to bring you the best content from Cisco Live in Barcelona. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Stay with us for more live coverage. Day two of three days of coverage here in the DevNet zone, packed with developers, learning new skills. We'll be back with more after this short break. Thanks.